Hello and good morning. I'm Pastor Jerry Bond. Welcome to an old cowboy talking about Jesus. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we love you and we thank you for this beautiful day. It's crispy, it's nice, it's beautiful. We have another day to worship you and praise you and be thankful in all the blessings that you give us. Thank you for forgiving us of our sins and restoring us to a right relationship to you. Thank you for your presence that's always with us, on us, and will never leave us. Thank you for all the promises that you've given us because they're all yes and amen. We love you and we thank you for your precious son. And we just give you glory in all things in the name of Jesus and all the people said amen. Today we're going to talk about John 14, verse 17, 16 and 17, mostly the latter part of verse 17. In his presence... The last part of that 17th verse, he said, I'm going to pray the Father in 16. I'm going to pray the Father, and he's going to give you the Holy Spirit who will be with, it, with you and in you and around you. And the world cannot receive him, but you shall know him, and he shall be in you, and his presence shall be in you and on you. We're talking about in his presence. Think about this for a moment. God had a plan thousands of years ago to restore mankind back to himself. Mankind fell in sin in the Garden of Eden, and because of that time until the day Jesus came and went into the bowels of the earth and restored and defeated Satan and restored mankind back to God by the shedding of his blood and the forgiveness of sins and the restoration of man back to himself. But the plan was that he would change his living place, his dwelling place. The plan was he would move out of the church building at Jerusalem, the big temple there, and he would live in our bodies. 1 Corinthians 3.16 says our body is the temple of God. Over in 1 Corinthians 6.19, know ye not that you have been bought with a price and that your body is the temple of God. Understand something about this. It was prophesied by Joel in chapter 2, verse 28. He said, in those days I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Now God had a plan what was his plan? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe in him would have eternal life. So God had a plan to restore us, to atone for our sins with the blood of Jesus, make us right before him, create in us a clean heart and take that stony hard heart out and put himself in, inside of us, living inside of our recreated spirit. 2 Corinthians 5.17 fits right in with this. It says, Behold, old things have passed away. Behold, a new creation, and all things are new. So when you get born again, receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Your sins are washed away by His blood. You've believed in your heart, and you've confessed with your mouth that salvation is here. Well, the Holy Spirit comes forth and was given on the day of Pentecost 2,000 years ago, 50 days after Jesus was resurrected, and he told us, he said, I have the power to lay down my life and to take it back up. Well, that resurrection power is what he gave us, God's life, God's love, God's presence in us. You know, you may have trouble under, trying to understand where we're going with this sermon, but let me give you some, some things that might help you. In Galatians chapter 5, you can read it for yourself. It talks about all the various kinds of sin. And it says, if you go on doing that, you cannot inherit the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. But he says, if you will repent of those sins and receive Jesus as your Lord, Christ as your Savior, then you've been set free. And then he says, the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit of God, God himself living within you, Christ within you, the hope of glory, Colossians 1.27. Well, he says there in that Galatians, he says, love joy, gentleness, peace, patience, kindness, long-serving, suffering, mercy, and goodness and faith are the presence, are the indwelling manifestation of the Lord in you. Well, come back over here to John, and if you'll, if you'll read the 14th, 15th, 16th, 17th chapters of John, those, those chapters in, in the book of John will create in you a whole dif different atmosphere or different attitude about your salvation. Jesus tells us here, he says, the Father and I, if you keep my commands, in that 21st, 23rd verse, he says, if you keep my commands, we will come and make our abode with you. We will come and live in you. We will come and manifest our presence to you. Now, a lot of people want to see the manifested presence of God. 
Well, you can look around you every day and there's miracles everywhere you look. You, you, I mean, it's just there because he's constantly moving over the face of the earth. His spirit is constantly moving in the hearts of the people. I was in the IHOP a few days ago and there was a lady came walking up and she was walking very stooped over with, on a walker. And, and I asked her, I says, if you asked the Lord today for something, what would you ask? And she, she really couldn't talk or say what she really wanted. So I asked her if I could anoint her with oil and pray for her. And so we anointed her head with oil and put, laid her hand upon her back and prayed a simple prayer calling for the enemy, that, that uh, spirit of infirmity that had been on her for 18 years, just like the woman in the Bible, to come off of her. And she immediately stood straight up. Now that is the manifested glory of our Father in human flesh. Now he quickened my spirit about the Bible verse that would back that up, which is in Luke where the woman was stooped and he says, is this not a child of Abraham? Are you not a child of God and a child of Abraham? Abraham was not a Jew. He's the father of us all, the Bible says. So we understand those things. When you begin to come forward and you see, if you'll do some little old simple things like loving God with all your heart, your soul, your being, and loving each other, all the things of the world tend to fall away from you. The manifested presence of God comes when the Holy Spirit was given. Jesus told us in various places about this. He told us in John chapter 4, verse 20 through 24, verse 14 through 24, he says, I'm going to give you a living water that will live within you and you'll never thirst. Well, most people think about the water they put in their mouth, but he's not talking about that. He's talking about the one he's in John 7, chapter 7, verse 37, 89, where he's talking about, if you're thirsty, come to me and you'll never thirst again. Then he says something. He said, out of your inward most parts shall flow a river of living water, which is the Holy Spirit. So you begin to understand that the Holy Spirit is come to bring the manifested presence of Father himself, Elohim, Jehovah God, the, the whole creator of the whole world has come to reside in me and you. Another interesting thing about it, he says he will be in you and around you and will never leave you. Well, then you'll say, well, I always thought, well, you know, and I've heard people say, well, once saved, always saved. No, that's not a statement in the word, even though it represents some things that's in the word. But John 10, 30, uh, 27 says an interesting statement. You're in the Father's and my hands and nothing can take you out of our hands. So God is holding you and supporting you in all these things that are happening to you. I was with some people a few days ago and they said, God is in control. And I said, no, he's not. And you say, what do you mean by that? I said, well, over in Genesis, he said, let us make man and give him dominion. Well, then Satan came and took it away from him. Well, Jesus in Colossians 2, 8 through 15 came and went into the bowels of the earth and took that authority away from Satan and gave it back to Jesus and brought it forth in Matthew 28 and in Mark 16. He says, all authority in heaven and earth has been given unto me. Go in my name and do these things. Go in the power of Jesus' name. We have the power of attorney of Jesus' name. We have the blood of Jesus to cleanse us. We have the Holy Spirit for the power that does those things. And God is just looking for somebody. He's just waiting. He's more quick to answer our prayers than we are to ask. And he's waiting on somebody that will step up and say, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, I'll do that. I'm submitted to you. I'm committed to you. I will do it. And so he's looking for us to do this. And his presence will manifest when you're full of the word. Because in Mark 16, verse 20, it says, signs, miracles, and wonders follow after the word. Well, the word is Jesus. Jesus came to the earth to fulfill what God said in Isaiah 55, verse 11. It says, my word shall not return to me void, but it'll do what I sent it to do. God sent his son Jesus to the earth to perform and bring mankind back to the righteousness of God and seat them in heavenly places filled with the spirit of God, walking in the things of God, blessed by God, moving in the abundant life that Jesus gives us. Now you may be like a lot of folks, you may say, well, the life I'm living is not abundant. Well, doggone it, repent. All it is is a little sin or maybe a big sin. But God is just and merciful to forgive you. You're so caught up in yourself with your selfishness and the things about you. You're not the only person on the face of the earth and, you, and you're not the only one having problems. But he says, I will take you through this. I will give you a way of escape in 1 Corinthians 10, 13. He said, my presence is always on you and around you. 
I was, I was reading my Facebook last night and there was a young woman on there and she says, I am so lonely I could just cry. Well, what, where does that come from? Loneliness is the opposite of, of God's presence. Loneliness is cause of selfishness, feeling sorry for yourself, a spirit of sympathetic. You know, I don't believe in sympathy. I believe in compassion. Uh, Matthew 9, verse 11, Jesus says, I desire compassion. Compassion is what moves God and what moves your heart. Sympathy is a, you're feeling sorry for somebody, you know, and you, oh, poor, you poor thing, you. Well, what does that get you? You poor thing, you. That is, a, is really a curse and a curse. They're saying, oh, you poor thing. Instead of saying, blessed are those whose feet walk before the Lord. Blessed, who's, who's God is, blessed is the man whose God is the Lord. When you start confessing the word of God over yourself, the word of God, which is Jesus, your whole life will change. Your countenance will change. Your whole being, your finances, everything. When you say, My, I'm poor, I'm penniless. Well, you're robbing God of, your t of his tithes and offerings. And people say, well, I don't believe in that. Well, help yourself then. You know, it's up to you to make a decision. I'm going to follow God and do what he tells me. And they're simple. They're easy. Little children love. You know, they say, Jesus, you know, is my Lord and my Savior. Little children do. Jesus loves me. This I know for the Bible tells me so. That is a big statement right there. Maybe some of us adults ought to be, become as little children. You know, I can t stand in before you and, and tell you these things all day long, and until you make up your mind, I want to receive a little something, you're just like, you're, you're like a barking dog on the outside of the corral. You're just out there barking and looking around, and nothing is happening. But once you make that decision, the Father says, I will take you. I will guide your footstep. My righteousness is upon you. I, I love that prayer over in James chapter 5, where at the end he says, the prayers of a righteous person avails much. You know, when you accept Jesus, you become righteous. You become sanctified. You become the wisdom and the revelation of who he is. You know, as I've studied for some of these sermons, and they're kind of different than what I heard back years ago in a denominational church, what the Lord was, has been giving me is how to live in the tumultuous times that we're in. You know, you have people that are religious, and they have a form of godliness, but they lack the power of. Well, Jesus told his disciples in Acts chapter 1, verse 4 through 8, he says, you shall receive power when the Holy Ghost has come upon you. To do what? To be his witnesses? Your life and my life is a witness about who our Father God is, what he does, how he does it, what he wants to do. You know, if you're walking full of love, you're not got hate in you. If you're walking love, you're not casting your friends out. You're not cutting your friends off. You're not saying unkind things. You're not in strife. You're not in jealousy. You're not saying curse words. You're not stealing and lying and kicking somebody's dog or riding their horse or stealing their cattle or cutting their fences. You know, you can do all kinds of things and say, well, I got away with that. No, you didn't. It, it'll, it'll cut you up to you sooner or later. It says everything done in darkness comes to light. But he's telling you, my presence is on you. Well, how is his presence on you? You invite him in. Let me show you how you do this. In, my, in Luke 11, <clears throat> verse 13, there's an interesting statement there. He says, if you being... Evil give good gifts to your children, and they ask you for a fish, will you give him a scorpion? How much more will our Heavenly Father give us the Holy Spirit to those that ask? When you, and you'll hear people say, well, you never know what you're going to get when you get into that. Well, you know exactly what you get because the Holy Spirit is God himself. If you can't believe that, you're not reading the Word. You're not understanding the Word. It says the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, they are three in one, and, and are one in three. They are one. And he sent himself to the cross to die for you in the form of his son, Jesus. And he died and that blood was shed to sanctify and cleanse your conscience and my conscience from all sin. And once and for all in, in Hebrews 10, 10, once and for all, he gave us eternal salvation and nothing can take it away from us. That is the presence of God. Well, let me take you a step deeper. In Philippians chapter 3, verse 9, he says that I might be found in him and that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the, and the afflictions that he went through. When we become a, a born-again Christian, a, a new creation in Christ, we're no longer an old sinner. We have, that thing has passed away. We're a new creation. He's recreating us inside out. But most people, they get born again and they get water baptized and they shut down. They sit down on the back row of the church and say, bless me if you can, pastor. They never get out. They never share their faith. They never do anything. And they expect God just to keep rolling the blessings upon them. 
we are required as children of God to get up, get out, and support the ministry of, of, of Christ, do what he tells us to do, to, to make witnesses, to share our, good, our faith in him, and to walk humbly before him. But we take up this other attitude. You know, if I get a, a, a nice home and a double garage and two cars and a motorboat and a, and a Winnebago and all the things that we get, an airplane and all of the things of this world, everything is okay. And if I throw 10 bucks in some little offering plate somewhere, all is well. It is not well within your soul, and you know that. You know that you're not doing the right thing. I'm not here to condemn you. I'm just saying to repent and come on. You know, there's more than just water baptism. Go read the book of Acts. In Acts 2, Acts 4, excuse me, Acts 8, Acts 10, Acts 19, there were disciples made and they sent for Peter, James, and John or even the apostle Paul. And they asked them, he says, in what you believed? And they said, in John's water baptism. He said, have you heard of the Holy Spirit in the 19th chapter? No, I have not. And Paul told them and laid hands on them. And they received the Lord, the, the Holy Spirit, and began to praise God in a heavenly language and prophesy. The whole is completely different than the salvation of water baptism. Water baptism is part of it. The being Jesus in the four gospels baptizes us with the Holy Spirit and with fire. The fire burns away the things of the world. When you, when you find a person that is truly born again, filled with this presence of God and full of the word of God, they are a very humble person. They are very uh, unique in the way that God uses them. And they are never bragging about what they do. They're always talking about what Jesus and the Father is doing. If you'll study John 14 and 15, you'll find something else. He's in 14, 26, he said, I'm going to send the comforter when the spirit of truth comes and he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance. Well, over in John 15, 26, he tells more. And he says he's going to talk about the, and give glory to the Father. I found something else pretty interesting about this. In John 16, verse 24, Jesus told the disciples, he said, up till now you've prayed this way, but change and pray this way. If you've been praying a prayer a long time for something and haven't received the manifestation of it, why don't you go back to the Word of God and ask the Holy Spirit to give you a Bible verse to back up what you're asking God for? Find out what the word says. All the promises of God are yes and amen. They're not no. So why are you sitting around outside the, the crowd fence waiting on something to happen when all you got to do is open the book set before you and ask the Holy Spirit to teach you and guide you in the ways of the Lord? You know, we live in a tumultuous time, but if you're walking in the Spirit, you do not have the tumultuous time. You have jo love, joy, and peace, and kindness, and the fruit of the Spirit, the indwelling presence of God manifested in you. John 15, 7 is my favorite verse, and it, it speaks a whole lot about the Christian walk or the presence of God. I never realized this 30 years ago in 1988, about this time of the year, I never realized I would never read this, this particular book in the Bible because I thought it was for girls and sissies. And I got to that 15th chapter and the Lord says, I am the vine and the father is the husband and you are the branches. And then he explains that my word has made you clean. His, Jesus' word has made us clean. And then he talks in that fifth verse, he says, without, he said, I'm the vine and you're the branches. Without me, you can do nothing. So we see people going in their own righteousness, their own way, trying to do things and they fall flat and they can't get there from here. And they're broke down, they're penniless, they're crippled, they're sick, they're whatever, all kinds of problems, and they never understand. Now, Christians have problems, but they have the answers too, if they'll walk in them. And then in that seventh verse, he says, if you abide, in other words, his presence abides, his living in you. He says, if you abide, if you live in Christ, you live in the word, you're living in Christ. So you live in the word. He says, if my word, if my word lives in you and you live in me, abiding in me, he says, ask anything and shall be given to you. I mean, that's pretty clear that whatever you ask, when you're living hooked up to the vine, Jesus, he will hook you up to the Father because in, in Corinthians, he says, we're in Jesus and Jesus is in the Father. So everything the Father has flows through Jesus into us and he brings these things forth into us, that indwelling presence. Well, when you allow the Holy Spirit to take you completely over and through a spirit of yieldingness, a, a spirit of humbleness will come on you, a spirit of holiness will come on you, and it's the Holy Spirit doing that. 
It's not you doing it. You can't cowboy this deal up. You can't whip it up. You can't get it from the priest, the rabbi, or your best friend. They can't do it. They can tell you about it, but they can't get it. You have to make up your mind that you want it. 30 years ago, I wanted it. I was hungry for the Lord. And I was reading this very book that we're talking about this morning, the presence, the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. I was seeking more. I'd been born again for 12 years. I was doing everything I could possibly do in that denominational church. But I never opened my Bible for Sunday to Sunday. I didn't, well, I didn't need it. You know, I heard the preacher on Sunday. I couldn't tell you what he said, but I heard him. I went. Never missed a Sunday night. Never missed a Tuesday night visitation. Did all those things. And I was as far away from God almost, except for my profession of faith. I was as far away from him as I was when I got saved. I never grew in the Lord. I never did anything. Oh, I went on visitation. We talked about the Lord. We did those things. It's like an insurance settlement. You bang on enough doors, you'll sell an old car or, or an insurance policy or a vacuum cleaner or a set of cattle. You'll do all those things. You know, how far does the, the acre or pecan fall from the tree? You know, how far out do you look? What is your thoughts today? Where are you today? What are you thinking about? Do you believe that God lives in you? Do you believe anything about the Bible is true? Do you believe when you pass away, you're going to heaven? Do you believe that you ought to have kingdom of heaven here on earth now? You know, I was always taught that when you kick the bucket your last breath, that you could get to go to heaven. Hallelujah, goody, goody. You know, we're there. But that wasn't the story. The story was false. When you get born again, you receive Christ as your personal Savior, the Lord of glory indwelling in you. Well, you say, I feel drier in a country whirlwind. Well, what is that? That is by your own doing. Over in 2 Timothy 1, 6, stir up the Holy Spirit that's in you. You wouldn't get born again without him. You know, you can't live without the Spirit of God. Try it sometime. Look around you and see the people that are without God. They're void of the Spirit in Jude, he talks about. But the indwelling presence, what does it do? John 6, 63 says, The Spirit of the living God brings forth life. The Holy Spirit gives life. Jesus said right there in that same verse, He says, My words are spirit and they are life. His words are spirit to your spirit person. His words are life to your whole being. You know, when you realize that the indwelling presence of God is there to change your heart, to bring you into a place where you can hear his voice, you can operate in his blessings, and you can know that you know that you know all is well with you. You know, you have power over the enemy. If you'd armor up for in Ephesians 6, 10 through 18 every day, put on Jesus, take the sword of the Spirit, and you can win every battle. But if you do not do that, you're trying to fight Satan, and he's greater than you in your own flesh. 1 John 4.4 4 will complete what we're talking about. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. The Holy Spirit lives within us. The indwelling presence of Almighty God lives within your bosom, lives within your chest, within your spirit. But if you do not ask the Holy Spirit to teach you and guide you in the spiritual thing, in 1 Corinthians 2 verse 9 through 14 talks that a natural man cannot receive this. The indwelling presence of a holy God on flesh. Read the 8th chapter of Romans and you're going to find that your flesh is in constant turmoil, opposition to the things of the Spirit. That is the reason you're in so much turmoil. That is the reason your life is upside down. You're trying to work your way and you're riding your horse backwards. You're going in the opposite direction. You know, do like the old pilot. Make a 180. In other words, completely turn yourself around and go in the other direction as hard as you can go because what you've been doing has not been working for you. How about changing your thoughts, your lifestyle, your, your faith in Him? How about getting your idea and get yourself right? Say, Lord, I missed you. I'm sorry. If you'll do that, He'll do what He promises to do. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you that by the stripes of Jesus, the people are healed. When we take the communion bread, that represents our healing. His broken body rep represents that. And the grape juice that we take, which represents the blood of Jesus, is the new covenant. We have been born out of the old and brought into the new and given better, better things than the old. And the old is fulfilled in, in Jesus and brought forth and teaches us that we are new creations in Christ. And that the spirit of the living God lives within us. Thank you for answered prayer. Thank you for all the blessings that you do in our lives. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And all the people said, Amen. You know,
Today, please subscribe to our daily devotions. There you can, you can at Pastor, let me excuse me just a minute. There you can view our TV schedule and the replays of our shows and subscribe to our social media. You know, please subscribe to uh, PastorJerryBond.com there where it says slash donations. You can go online and you can help us if you'd like. This old cowboy taking a message about Jesus and him crucified, him resurrected, and the Holy Spirit given on the day of Pentecost. That's a simple gospel message. It says, if you'll believe in your heart, confess with your mouth, you shall be saved. That word saved in the Greek means so-so, means healed. So you have all that you need. You know, there's a place there on the screen where you can send money through the mail if you'd like. We're here for you 24-7. Our message is simple so that anyone and everyone can receive it. And it's not, you don't have to whip something up. All you have to do is, is just believe Jesus. All you have to do is trust in Him. Ask Him to help you. The manifested glory of our Father comes through the Holy Spirit that lives within us. You know, we would like to do many more things in the, in the kingdom, and we need your help to come aboard. You know, if you like what we're doing, you know, we appreciate that you step up. Send, send, send offerings and tithes to us. Don't take it away from your local church. We're not trying to build a building, but send it in, in and we will definitely do exactly what you want done with it. You know, we go on mission tours with all over the world. We've seen thousands and thousands of people saved. We've seen thousands of people healed. We've seen all kinds of miracles. God is in the business of blessing us. If you'll come aboard, we're all part of one another and join us and help us take this message that Jesus Christ is Lord and King. You will reap the benefits of making that decision. You know, it's a decision every day. I choose this day whom I'm going to serve. Who are you going to serve? The flesh, the devil, are you going to serve Almighty God and your Lord, your Savior, Jesus? Are you going to be filled with the presence of God, the Holy Spirit? You know, give it to him. If you have a problem today, give it to him. Say, Lord, help me take care of business here. And I promise you he will. And we pray and do all these things in the powerful name of Jesus. And all the people said, Amen.